In this episode of Mind Pump, the world's top fitness, health, and entertainment podcast, we answer fitness and health questions. And these are asked by listeners. They actually go to our Instagram page, Mind Pump Media. They go under the Qua meme. They post the question. Le Qua. We pick four of them, and then we answer them. Uh, but the way we open the episode is talking about current events. We mention studies. We talk about our workouts. Sometimes we mention our sponsors. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you a breakdown of this entire episode. Now, the first 45 minutes is that intro portion that I just talked about. We start out by talking about Greg Glassman. Uh, this was the guy Ooh. that founded CrossFit, got himself into a lot of trouble for some insensitive tweets, um, and now has stepped down as the CEO of CrossFit. This is huge. Then we talked about farmer walks. This is an exercise a lot of people don't do because it doesn't work a specific body part, but whoa, the benefits you can get from doing this exercise. Then we talked about doing one exercise for a lot of sets versus doing a lot of exercises for few sets. So we talked about the benefits of that. Then we talked about blood type. Believe it or not, a certain blood type may actually have uh, some protective mechanisms type against, negative. Ow. <laughs> against the COVID and the coronavirus. Then we talked about asymptomatic transmission of COVID or, as the World Health Organization now just said, that might actually be rare, uh, which means we were locked up for no reason. Jerks. Yeah. Then we talked about the year 2020. What a great year it's been. <laughs> <laughs> Big fart noise. Which led us to talking about knowledge versus wisdom, what the difference is. Uh, then Adam brought up a book that he's been reading, Thinking Fast and Slow by Daniel uh, Kahneman. Uh, sounds like a very interesting book. And then Justin talked about drinking alcohol and hey, how it, cheers. It, it calms him down sometimes and how we use Z-Biotics uh, before we drink because the genetically modified bacteria in z patented breaks down some of the negative byproducts of alcohol. So you drink and the next day you don't feel like a turd. Um, anyway, z is one of our sponsors. You can get a discount if you go to Z-Biotics, that's the letter Z, B-I-O-T-I-C-S dot com forward slash mind pump, you get 10% off your first order. And by the way, you can go there and just try three bottles. And I'm telling you right now, it will literally blow your mind at how effective it is at preventing the negative next day effects from alcohol. Then we got into the fitness questions. Here's the first one. This person wants to know if stomach vacuums are an effective core exercise. So we talk about stomach vacuums and their value. The next question, this person says, look, I'm trying to gain strength. Is it beneficial to stay in the three to five rep range for all the lifts or just for the main lifts of the workout? The next question, this person wants to know what popular exercises we think are a total waste of time. So we talk about exercises we think should not exist. Mm. And the final question, this person's been following our blogs and our information. By the way, if you go to the Mind Pump Media page, there's lots of written information on exercise and fitness. Good stuff. But they want to know why some of our articles say things like the best ways for women to lose weight or how to eat if you're an ectomorph because it seems to counter uh, our message. And so we explain a little bit about how we're using effective marketing to give people good information. We're sneaky. Also, we're in June. That means it's summertime. That means most of you are interested in probably burning body fat and getting leaner. So we decided to put our most effective fat burning and calorie burning program on sale. It's 50% off. The program is MAPS HIT. Now, HIT stands for High Intensity Interval Training. It's very effective at burning lots of calories in a short period of time. It's a short program, six week long. If you combine it with good nutrition, you will see significant fat loss in your body. It's done with weights so that you don't lose muscle. Um, if you enroll in the program, you get all the exercise demos and videos and exercise, basically everything you need to follow the program. So here's how you get the 50% off. Go to mapshit.com. That's M-A-P-S-H-I-I-T. Dot com and then use the code HIT50. That's H I I T five zero, no space for the discount. Can you do the dit, 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 like the news thing? Breaking news. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Greg Glassman steps down from CrossFit. Wow. Oh, did I not call that? I feel like I called that you in the last uh, uh, podcast. You did. I yeah. think, uh, were you the first one to call it? Yes. You were. I was. Dude, he's, uh, I mean, it makes sense. Yeah, that's like really the only move they had left. Yeah. Yeah. Don, to, 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 to save some kind of face for the brand. It is. It is bad. Did you, now, I went through and I read everything that he said, 
and it was definitely insensitive. But wow, the reaction was strong. Yeah, and that's just kind of the state, uh, the the high alertness. Like everybody's just so like venomous. Right you, you know what it reminds me of? Did you guys ever? I don't know. Maybe you have Justin because your kids are getting older. What's that? What are those books? Are like a uh, of the the fifth grader, something about the fifth grader, where there he, he talks about growing up and uh, you know being a kid in elementary school, and then there's like a there's like a piece of old cheese on the blacktop, uh-huh. and in the stories, if somebody touches the cheese, they have the cheese touch, and nobody wants to go around them. What? Nobody wants to touch. It's a funny book, right? It's no, I've never I heard haven't it. seen that. It's a great you, book for kids. You had me at cheese. Yeah, yeah. I, no, I haven't seen. So that. I feel like Greg Glassman has the cheese touch right now. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I feel like he, in the story, he touched the cheese. Everybody just fucking ran. He touched the cheese. <laughs> he <does>. He's got <laughs> cooties. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> nobody wants to go Bro, around. You got the cooties. Guy. Don't get don't get near me. Yeah. 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 What's what's the deal? So oh, so speaking of gyms, I'm getting messages from people who are saying that they're going to their gyms, and they're packed. That's what I'm hearing too. They're packed and nobody gives a shit about the regulations. They're just in there working out. I've heard um, the same thing. That's I, I love it. I it mean, does make a part people, of me loves that. It do, well, it makes me happy because uh, you know, being fit and healthy is so important for your health. Yeah. It's so important what's, for your health. What's ETA for essential. Santa Clara? What are we what are I mean, I see boarded up fucking gyms still, right? What's going on with us? I have no idea, dude. You don't know? We're we're, we're slow California's motion. California's really there. dragging their feet on this whole thing. Yeah. Well, uh, the the cases are spiking in California, mostly in LA. Uh, I know in Santa Clara we're actually doing pretty good. Yeah. I know, but that's why I'm wondering why when, when or why why have we not opened up our gyms here? Uh, I think that there's a criteria that they follow that that hasn't been met. Um, I don't know what that criteria is, or even mm. if it's if it's realistic. What I find interesting is the how much fear there was around people getting together. Yeah. Don't have more than ten people together. You can't go to church. You can't do anything. Everybody be don't do. It. And it, then it's so hypocritical. And then mass protests, and they're like, "This is cool. Let's all do this." And nobody's like, really, not even like just smashed into each other. Yes, touching and each other. And they're still keeping everything closed, even though they allow. Not not saying that they shouldn't allow it. I'm just saying. No, but uh, I I don't know. Yeah, it is. It's it's weird. Yeah, like you said, with with churches not even being able to uh, you know meet up or I actually saw like a church where their members were outside and they were all like kind of spaced out, but they were still trying to make it happen which is good to see yeah well for some people that's a very important part of their life yeah and i think you know community matters man we should we, we should be free enough to decide that for ourselves i was reading the opinion. article that you sent over last night sal i thought that was pretty uh funny was the the halt on hollywood right now with uh films related to cops and the, that they want them to stop all production oh my god stop what? all yeah stop all production on any movies or series that are being shot currently right it, now it was an opinion to article to re- rethink their what uh, the the message so the sending. tv show cops Pulled off the air after I don't know how many years of being on the air. Do you guys wow, know that's that? one of the longest running shows what ever. You want yes, to do? pulled off the air. I didn't know that. And then that was an opinion article in the Washington Times. Okay, and it was calling for eliminating all movies and TV shows that have to do uh, with police. Which yeah, they, that's the article right there. Yeah, shut down all police movies and TV shows now. Yeah. Wow, what a ter- what a dumb uh, like extreme. Marxist reaction. Yeah. Don't people have no history? You know, you know what's in the market. Okay, so there's a there's a playbook, by the way, for Marxism. Part of it is erasing, uh, not just erasing history, but eliminating and uh, you know creating more propaganda by eliminating things you disagree with mm-hmm. completely. And this is kind of along those lines. Like, what would elim- what would getting rid of all cop shows <laughs> nothing. do? It would do nothing. There's way worse TV out there. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's like, really? Dude, <laughs> we have TV shows and movies that show rape and children getting hurt and, like, terrible stuff. But cops, fuck it. We well, we t- learn from history. How do we learn if we're going to, like, erase everything? Oh, dude. You ever look at those – you ever see those old photos from uh, the Soviet Union and from Nazi regimes where they would have, like – so in the Soviet Union, what they used to do is if there was like somebody in the party or someone that they needed to eliminate, not only would they kill them, but then they'd go back and edit out the person's photos out of every picture that existed with them, um, take them out of existence as if they never existed at all. Yeah. They used to do this. Wow. And so yeah, dude. So if you're like a political enemy in the Soviet Union and they killed you, they would eliminate any He's mention wipe of wipe you, you from history. Like completely. you never existed at all. Wow. <laughs> 
Yes. Wow. <laughs> That's fucking crazy. Wow. Scary. Yeah. Isn't that crazy? That is crazy. Yeah. Dude, you look um you're looking fit these days. What's what's happening? I'm a I'm a fitness guy actually. Shut up. <laughs> <laughs> Shut up. No, what's going on? Are you it's doing probably something? his underleggings. Well, I mean, makes you, him look fast. <laughs> <laughs> underleggings? His long underwear? Yeah. 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 I appreciate that, though, so I don't see you know any ball hanging out. Well, right today, was, uh, today I have plans to do a Turkish get up, so I'm in my kind of workout attire for our. In, we, you know, one of the things we. I think we went with like uh, the most affordable or cheap grass when we first built this thing. Mm-hmm. I, because it's <laughs> it like. It fucking hurts. Oh, it tears yeah, you the yeah. fuck up, dude. So, yeah. and it's like 90 something degrees today. I didn't want to wear a pants so i'm wearing you know my long underwear like you said so mm-hmm. i can protect my knees when I'm, I'm training today do you feel uh like better performance from having tight long underwear on um you know what i i actually do like to squat it i don't know if you've ever done that before that's no. why i'm that's why i'm saying it. yeah you know it does it does because they, they're so tight the compression shorts is what sal's talking about for people in compression pants mm-hmm. um i do like i do like the feeling of them when you when i'm heavy squatting that's not the purpose of why i'm wearing them today i'm wearing them today like, like i just told you is if i'm doing walking lunges turkish get if i'm doing anything on our grass I got to either be in pants or got to do something for like my knees or just tears them, Dude, tears them up. One of my it's not not very good. It's like razor blades. One yeah. thing I used to do when I was younger, when I thought bench press was the, like the be all end all, I had to get stronger my bench press. I ha- I would always wear like a, a slightly too tight t shirt on bench day. I bet it felt good though. Yeah, it did. Yeah, it did. I had this one shirt that I always wore. I mean, it's like sleeves or Everybody's knee wraps. I mean, sim- similar concept, it's, right? It was cotton. It's not really that big yeah. of a deal. Yeah. But I did it. <laughs> Dude, you know what I'm falling in love with right now? Mm. Um, farmer walks. Uh, f- farmer walks. <laughs> the he- best. Heavy farmer walks are making my arms grow. Mm-hmm. No joke. Mm. Just the heavy tension and holding them and then having to stay steady. and, and Not all the extra calories you're eating. Yeah. <laughs> no. no, that's not that's that's part nothing, of it. That's nothing to do with it. No, you know, between <laughs> farmer walks and then also, like, I've been, uh, again, doing more. It, this has motivated me to do more work outside of my house. And so I've been, you know, doing a lot of digging and, and like, moving of dirt with a wheelbarrow. I forgot how, like, taxing that is. I was like, God, man, I'm turning into a little bitch. Yeah. <laughs> Why? <Well, I, laughs> I get so excited. Exhausted after I'm done, I'm just like, oh, dude. Manual need to rest. Manual labor is no joke. Yeah, it's totally different. So right now, um, so Jessica went to go visit her her mom in uh, Nevada, right? So it's just me and the kids. During the day, I my dad right now is is he, he's helping some people do some work in his backyard and, and kind of building out a, a, a patio or whatever. So my dad's like, hey, do you want to take your son over here and he can help me throughout the day? And I'm like, absolutely. Because my kids, you know, and I mean, partly it's my fault, but I don't do a lot of manual labor, so my kids have no experience with real manual labor. So I'm like, this is going to be a good time. Yeah. So I brought my son over, and my son's a hard worker. He'll help you. He'll work. He's not lazy. He just, he's just not used to it, right? So I took him over there, and, you know, I'm texting my mom, and she's like, oh, he's, you know, he's really working hard. I said, yeah. And she goes, yeah. She goes, but it's funny because your dad, my dad has been working hard labor since he was nine. He's got arthritis up and down in his spine. He's got achy joints because of it. But he's got a motor. Well, oh, dude. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. so she's like, she's like, your son will sit down. Your son will tank. sit down like on the chair to take a break, and then I'll tease him about it and be like, your grandfather's still going. He'll stand up like, oh crap, I need to. Yeah. So after after they were done, right, I go there to to grab them. It's like four p.m. And uh, my son comes inside, and you, I can just look at his face. He's tired, bro. <laughs> just ghosted. Bro, just, he, oh. fell, he fell asleep on the couch for like two hours, dude. <laughs> <laughs> I was done. This morning he woke up, and he was all sore. Uh, I'm like, it's all weak, dude. See, it makes him appreciate. What are they doing? What are they like, building? What are they doing? So my parents' house in the back, they had a, a patio that my dad had originally built years ago when I was a kid. Uh, but it was time to redo it, and he wanted to extend it and make it even bigger. Uh, okay. So, you know, big, big planks of, you know, redwood and... Mm-hmm. You got to tear it down and do the whole thing. And so he's out there doing it. And, you know, my son's out there trying to help. And it's just crack. And then my daughter, my 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 mom, because my daughter was there and uh, she's only 10. So she can't help too much with my dad. So she was, uh, my mom was help, was teaching her how to make some of her favorite dishes. Mm-hmm. So my 10-year-old, she knows how to make pasta with pesto. She was telling me all about it. Oh, she's making cool. banana bread. And I'm like, yeah, this is now, great. It's now, better than school. When mm-hmm. you send your son over there to do something like that, is that like a, uh, you tell him, I just want you to go do this? Or do you incentivize him? Like uh, nothing. No, oh, what do you, yeah, no. <laughs> yeah, it's, so it's, it's, it's child labor. It's, uh, oh, yeah. Yeah. No, 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 no. It's, it's to work. It, you know what? It, I, I talk about contribute. I say, uh, I love it when you guys contribute to the family. 
Mm-hmm. And I think it gives them a sense of a little bit of a sense of pride. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, I understand paying kids to do certain things. That's also a valuable lesson, but right. I don't want it to replace yeah. contributing and helping the family. Just to it, help. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, you I know? get it. That's why I was just curious. I'm curious to how you presented it to them, right? Because not every kid... You know, on a on a summer break or whatever, wants to go help uh, help grandpa. Then they build. just turn into a little turd that's just like always expecting money for all their efforts of everything. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's I'm always like like balancing that out and trying to see if you know because I do want to like incentivize them every now and then be like you know like this if you do this for me you, you know you can earn 10, 15 bucks whatever and then you know have them actually like be incentivized by that. But other times I'm just like okay you got to do this because you're part of the family. Now have you got with lessons like that because I know you both have implemented things like that uh is there a clear distinction between uh, the two of them the two kids because you both have two on who's like the better saver and who's like just as soon as they make any money they spend it right away oh that's a great question Hmm. um you know what both my kids are pretty good about saving their money they're they're pretty good like i'll say hey did you want to take your money to the store to buy it no no i'm going to save a little bit more to buy something else um so that's that's a good question yeah i think well (sighs) Ever it, he would like to spend it right away. I mean, that was like the the initial reaction from him. Like when you get, yeah, and then he'd want to go buy some useless piece of plastic from like the dollar store, or some you know bullshit. And then I, and then later on, he started to see his brother and like how he was like saving it and stacking it up and like he was, buy some cool, yeah. And he's just like, oh wow, I need to, I need more, I need more. And he's the one actually asking me for more jobs. Because he's trying to catch up to his brother, it's a totally competitive thing. So, oh, that's cool. Yeah, so that's that's started to take off. Which yeah, is good. it's it's a great experiences are such a great way to to learn um, for kids. I mean, you know, working with my dad, I didn't t- I took it for granted as a kid, of course, because you just oh got to wake up early in the su- summertime. That means I got to wake up at five a.m. to go help dad work or whatever. And yep. you know, I was the guy that would clean his tool because you know he works with mud and, and concrete and cement and all that stuff. So. You know, if you get some dirty, I have to go out and spray with the hose. So it's like 6, 7 a.m., you know, and it, we'd be up in the city when it's, for whatever reason, always freezing in the summer. And I, you know, ah, oh, my hands are, and then I have to carry things for them. And I kind of hated it. But yeah. looking back, a lot of uh, my attitude towards work and, you know, some of the mental toughness that and I think I'm going to have. Character and grit. 100%. Yeah. Those you know? are such undervalued uh, characteristics these days. You could tell when people don't have it, when they when they work and they just are, you know, for lack of a better term, wimps. Yes. You know what I mean? Like, uh, I can't Absolutely. do that. Uh, I remember I had a trainer once, uh, and this was a wonderful lesson for the rest of my trainers, where, you know, we, you manage a gym and part of your job as a trainer, this is my personal opinion, but I think it happens to be right. Part of your job is also taking care of the gym. That's the equipment. That's your equipment. It's not just the, the the porter's job to clean stuff. You as a trainer, this is the equipment you're using. You need to take pride in it. And so mm-hmm. I had a trainer actually tell me that, like, I, I'm a trainer. I'm not here to clean stuff. And I said, well, that's awesome. So you can go ahead and leave now <laughs> and go, yeah. go work somewhere else. <laughs> uh, I'm not going to contribute. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm above that. Yeah. Hey, one more thing too about um, the workout that I had this morning that every once in a while I throw this. You guys ever do this where you're supposed to do, let's say, 10 sets for a, a body part, like 10 sets for chest? But instead of doing three or four exercises, just, just one. Do all press. exercise. I love to do that. Mm-hmm. Isn't that great? I love to do that. Yeah, I get such a good uh, feel from that. Yeah, it, it's it's just like one of those things where it's just easy on your mind. It's like I'm just focused on this, and and that I think that's that's an element too to working out. We talk about it every now and then in terms of the mindset going into a workout. That's a that's a great way to really like focus in on one specific thing and then kind of bring that element back into the other types of workouts. Yeah, I noticed. When I do that, like the first few couple sets, uh, or by the third set, I'm actually stronger than the first tip top couple. Yeah. And then I get stronger, stronger. And then by the sixth set, I start to get fatigued and come down. And then the way I uh, I feel the next day um, is that there's a distinct feeling uh, in my body. And I get really, really strong at that exercise when I practice it that way. So I'm not saying it's the only way to work out, but it's one I think a lot of us you know, tend to forget or whatever. Yeah. Anyway, got some, I read some good news, uh, well, at least for me. Oh, um, good. I like good news. So this was, I talked about this a while ago. There were some speculations that certain blood types protect people from severe symptoms of COVID. Oh, is that true? More evidence. Really? Yes. Type O. So type O blood may actually uh, provide some uh, protection 
hmm. against the, the, the coronavirus. Now, is this COVID. just like a correlation they've made because statistically typo people have less deaths in comparison to other blood types or like how, I mean. They're all asymptomatic? No. Or? Well, yeah, there's, there's, a few, there's a few now uh, studies that they've done that, are, that keep pointing to that. And that's not the first time. I mean, blood types can definitely affect how your body reacts to certain diseases and so it's not like it's it's you know radically new or whatever, mm-hmm. uh, but yeah, apparently it's got. To, now I've also reading articles that are saying that the COVID or coronavirus is a blood vessel disease, mm. not like not necessarily a respiratory disease. Oh, interesting. Because what they're finding is high instances of, st- of strokes in young people. Wow. Uh, have you guys heard of the symptoms that some kids typically don't get symptoms, but when they do, they get this weird like swelling and redness in their hands and feet. And in their face and eyes, hmm. um, they think a lot of the issues that some. So our friend, um, Dr. Jolene Brighton, when mm-hmm. she got it, um, I haven't talked to her about this, but she would post about it. She her lungs were perfectly fine. They X-rayed them, no problems with the lungs, but she still had super low blood oxygen levels. So it all points to that this may be more of a blood vessel type disease in a circulatory disease than it is a didn't respiratory they also disease. yeah like uh, eliminate uh, like the ventilators used to be like this this high priority that we needed all these and then all of a sudden like they they weren't using them in treatment yeah i think when you get on a ve- ventilator your the chance of dying is even high it's like yeah like it was doing yeah the more of harm than good crazy right yeah crazy which is weird and then did you guys see the statement from the world health organization that's causing all the Controversy. Yeah, Mm-mm. they're saying that asymptomatic transi- uh, transmission of COVID is rare. So, in other words, uh, if if unless you're actively sick and have a fever, the statement was that you're probably not going to get it from someone who's not showing any symptoms. So, this whole idea of quarantine <sighs> for two weeks is kind of silly. Then, totally. Wow. Totally. So, basically, if you're sick, you should stay inside. Yeah. Right. But if you're not, you probably shouldn't. Kind of like normal rules. Yeah. Like, <laughs> can we go back to those? Yeah. You know, like holy shit. Isn't that isn't that wild? Yeah. That that's kind of. I haven't even been following it at all. I mean, obviously, I I once, about once the going. protests hit, it kind of just like disappeared on the news. Is it resurfacing? I, I mean, are we hearing more and more? I mean, I, cases are spiking right now, right? In some places, overall, they're still going down. Mm. But in some places, we're seeing you know some spiking. So. I can't. I can't help but like think i was like thinking about uh just all the crazy madness that's happened this year like so far and like i remember um we were up in tahoe uh you know kind of springing in the new year and the very first day like i almost killed myself oh that's when you blasted your head on the <laughs> yeah on the i did and just went almost unconscious like had this throbbing pain like for, for the next few days and i'm like am i in a simulation am i in a different uh, reality now <laughs> every and ever like, since then like the whole year since fucked. then dude and then kobe died on my birthday and like there was wildfires in australia that almost like burned the entire continent <laughs> You know, and then like the the COVID, like you know Trump, like uh, I guess you know like his his impeachment, you know got uh, uh, you know That's like disbanded, whatever. Like it was just like all these events, like just stacked like back to back to back to back, and then riots, and then here we are. What if? Okay, I'm not trying to freak you out, but what if you didn't actually wake up? What if you hit the ice and Damn. right now you're in a coma? You're dreaming this whole fucking Damn. thing. Mm-hmm. And then you're going to wake up soon and Adam ju- and Doug it's like, and It's I, like the pinch test. Like you'd think that like, I feel pain. I don't know, you man. You know what I mean? I don't know. And what if we're standing over you, you wake up. You like, guys. <laughs> you've been out for 24 hours. And this whole thing I'm happened. I'm just making all this up. It's all in my mind. <laughs> Screw right you. Now, Get me out of your crazy <laughs> coma. I don't like this reality. Sometimes I want to go back. Sometimes I think it's, I, is it really that crazy or is it just, the way news travels today compared to what it did just a decade ago. I mean, I think it's both. You think so? Yeah, I think that the hmm. part of the craziness is that news travels hella that, fast. That's what I mean. Yeah, that's, I, I feel like uh, you know, if we were to go back, like if we had like the, all the, the events, news is the virus. Like the events that you just listed, fair, right? Those are all crazy things that are happening in mm. 2020. But if you were to like chart them all out and then just go back a decade or two decades ago and pick a random year, mm-hmm. would there be as many weird, crazy, shitty things that were, were happening in the world? We just are able to get access to it so much faster and, and inundate it with, with news. How, how often do we make a rate? How often do we make things worse because of our just Always. tremendous fear and hype and panic? Always. 100%. Yeah. yeah. Well, most people get their news from like Twitter now, dude. 280 characters. 
for how the hell do you explain like unqualified compl- people that haven't done any research <laughs> yeah. that just throw shit well, up there? I love when my buddy, out. I love when we're like in a debate, like my buddies and I, and my buddy sends a tweet over like, this, uh, <laughs> as this, evidence. Yeah, this is <laughs> this is your evidence because so and so tweeted like Dateline. Really? No, no, no. It was a tweet. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Dude, uh, yeah. dude. It's do you guys have a family member or friend who's the one that like when something happens in the world they obsess over it? And yes. They text, yes. Text, 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 and yes. freak out. Okay. Yes. That's what social media highlights. Mm-hmm. It, those people who normally in regular life. So here's what normally what would happen. There's like I, a million chicken littles out yeah, there. Yeah, I have a fr- I have a group of friends, right? And there's the one person where something happens and they just obsess about it. And eventually, what ends up happening, you just stop hanging out with them. Mm-hmm. You're like, ah, whatever. That guy's they're, yeah. they're freaking out. I can't yeah. be around this too much. <laughs> it's okay, too, too toxic for me. Well, that's what social media is. Yeah. It's those are the people that are crushing on social media. Yeah, mm-hmm. they have. A, you know what I'm saying? They'll say the scary thing, and then it made me think a lot today about yeah, they get rewarded for it. They, so it made me think a lot today about the difference between, uh, you know, knowledge um, and wisdom. And we're you know, we're in an interesting time. We have never in human history ever have we ever had this much access and this easy access to information at all. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, when I was a kid, if you wanted to learn something. You had to go to the library, and even there, you were limited to how many books that that library had on whatever you're trying to learn. Well, right now, I could literally, on my phone, which most people have, most people nowadays have a, have a, have a phone with access to the internet, I can go on there, and not only can I access books on what I want to learn about, I can access all the books, mm-hmm. all of them, ever, that have ever been written. So we have this incredible access to to information, which gives us knowledge, but it doesn't give us any wisdom at all. So I think a lot of the stuff that we're seeing is the is the consequences of knowledge without wisdom. Because wisdom, you need to have knowledge to get to be to be wise. But wisdom doesn't just come from information; it also comes from experience. It comes from Listening to people who are, have wisdom, spiritual practices uh, are, I mean, that's where we historically humans have learned wisdom. Um, and so I think a lot of this stuff that we see, and you, here's the deal. What does a lot of knowledge without wisdom turn into? It's like narcissism. It's, uh, you know, self-importance. You mm-hmm. know what it reminds me of? Okay. We all went through this. Every, every person in this room did. When you're growing up and you're a kid, right? You don't know much. You're just a kid. Mm-hmm. But at some point, you actually start to learn a lot of information, but you still have very little experience. Those are your teenage years. How do teenagers behave? Oh, yeah. They behave erratically. Like, like nothing's going to happen to them. They behave erratically. They have outbursts. They Because they have a lot of information, all of a sudden they know stuff, but they have zero wisdom. So they say shit like, whatever, mom and dad, I'm going to move out. I can take care of myself. Yeah. I, know what, I know how much jobs pay. I know how much... It costs to rent an apartment. I'm gonna, yeah. you know, that kind of shit. And yeah. you're like, you have no that idea. That guy kid. pissed me off. I'm gonna break his window. Well, <laughs> so, yeah. someone like uh, Daniel Kamen, which is a book I'm reading right now, uh, Think Fast and Slow, would, I don't know if he would disagree with you, but I think he would present it differently, right? So the the way he presents it in the book, which is absolutely brilliant, uh, psychologist and economist, and won the Nobel Prize. And he talks about how our, our brain operates on two different systems, and, um, and it and alludes to what you're talking about right now. And it's not so much the difference of knowledge and wisdom, but more so what, what operating system are you using when you make decisions? And most of us are working in that fast, and which is thing that, that our, our brain is naturally doing just on its own, like on auto, mm. It'd be based off of our experiences, the things right. that we see, that we take in really quick, and then you have this natural- it's just like predictive algorithm right. like thrown at. And it takes, it, it takes a lot of self-awareness to be able to switch from that operating system to the more logical one, which is slow and process. The same thing that you would do to solve a problem. Like if I threw a, a, a multiplication prob- a problem at you, even one that's like 17 times 20. Okay. Now, right now, when I say that number to you guys, if you're trying to figure that out, your brain automatically starts to switch over to the logical side. It starts to remember when you learn multiplication in your head, you're starting to break that down, but it's a, it's a longer, slower process. That's the logical start system in your brain. Then you have the other one, which is more reactive, which is like driving. Like you don't think about you know, oh, you got to take this turn right now. You got to think, how do I do that? You just do that. 
And so when we, we react to things in news or we react to things that we're learning, a lot of times we're operating in that first system where we just, based off of our experiences, based off of what we've seen before, based off the information that we've read before, our brain says, this is the answer. And it just, it, it will just guesstimate and mm -hmm. it'll go in that direction. Mm -hmm. And it takes a ton of discipline and self-awareness to know, er, pump your brakes. How do I switch my brain over into the logical side? And most people just don't operate that mm -hmm. way. Yeah. Most people don't use that unless they absolutely have to use that. And the skill is when you have issues or things that are in heightened or that a lot of risk, right, with you saying something or doing something, being able to stop and not allow that first system to take over and to switch over into the second one. Well, and it's hard too in these days where you get rewarded for like your first knee jerk reaction. You know, like you get all these people on your side, you know, for just like uh, reacting and saying something well, that's going to be. And the, the the theory behind that is that they're that's because everybody's operating in that system, yep, and right. so it just confirms all their bias. Yeah, exactly. Right? Yeah. They all feel the same emotional reaction. They all saw the same thing, and so therefore they all quince right away jump to it, and so. If you come out and react to that, tons of people jump on board right away because they feel the same way too. Yeah. It completely eliminates the logical side yeah, out. Dude, this is why- Snuffs out all that uh, train of thought. This is why my absolute favorite demographic of people to train were, were people in advanced age. Now, I'm not saying all people in advanced age are wise um, and self-aware, but a much larger percentage of them are versus younger people. And when I would train them, I would ask them questions- and you know this is because over time, what you learn as a trainer, and God, one of the best lessons I ever learned as a trainer was how effective it was to listen. Because as I listened, I was better, I was more effective with my clients in terms of getting them to eat properly and getting them to train properly. I learned that through years of trial and error. And so I, without realizing, I adopted this. Both of you guys have talked about this too. I adopted this philosophy of listening, and that allowed me when I would train older people. I would talk about a subject, you know, you talk to your clients all the time. And with older clients, oftentimes the rest periods are longer, so there's more conversation. And I'd ask them things just to have good conversation. And because I learned to listen, because I wanted to be an effective trainer, I, you know, indirectly or as a side effect, I would get this incredible wisdom. And so I'd talk to them about, and I started to realize why, why older people move slower. And that's not necessarily because they can't move fast. That's sometimes the case. But if you really observe older wise people, they 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 talk a little slower. They think they they let things process, and it's not because they're slower. It's because they're wiser. No, they've learned to switch that other, that other operating system. Yes. And many times, what that is too is just as default because they've learned through experience operating in the other system so much as not serve them well. Yeah. Reacting and just saying how they feel, even if they do feel that way, a lot of times may have got them in trouble. And so years and years and years or decades and decades of, of learning that, they start to wise up in your, in which you're, to your point and they get wisdom and they go, okay, I may feel this way when Sal asked me that question because of all these reasons, but before I just react and say what I'm going to say, I'm going to switch out of that system, think logically, listen to everything he's having to say, process take, it. yeah, process everything, and then and then present my information. Uh, dude, it reminds me, okay, so, and I'll just take it back to fitness again. Think of the inexperienced trainer versus the experienced trainer. Somebody walks up to them and says, Hey, I want to lose body fat. Uh, you know, I want to do it. And I, I, my goal is thirty pounds. The the you know weight loss. The inexperienced trainer is like, no problem. We're going to cut your cardio. We're going to or we're going to increase cardio. We're going to cut your calories. Here's what we're going. to yeah. The experienced trainer is going to say, well, here, let me ask you more questions. Or they'll answer a question by saying, well, it depends. It depends on the context. It depends on your history. It depends on how, because as an experienced trainer, you understand that the answer isn't just X or Y. Almost never is it just. X or Y because of the experience you gain working with people. And I swear, man, we are literally suffering the consequences right now. It, it Really, look at the way people are reacting to – look at the way people react to anything. It's with a high level of arrogance and narcissism, a very low level of wisdom. Look at the way science mm -hmm. uh, sometimes uh, is applied. Science is, I mean, one of the most effective ways to gain knowledge doesn't lack – or it lacks wisdom, though. It's not supposed to have lots of wisdom. It's just supposed to provide lots of facts and knowledge. And this is why you get scientists who just do stuff yeah. without really thinking, should I? 
is this wise and what are the other implications? Or the There's... unintended consequences. Totally. I, that, that should be a conversation in any direction. Is like, you know, if I'm presenting this, what are the unintended consequences as a result of pushing this forward? It's just like the, the slowing down process is so necessary. And that's why, you know, there used to be a council about that, you know, like ethical practices uh, within, you know, science and medicine and things like that. Nobody fucking talks about that anymore. It's just what can we do? Where can we go with this? Yeah, I, one of the best pieces of advice I ever got in terms uh, for relationships was from uh, an older client who had been married for, I don't remember how many years, it was decades, right? And they said, you know, and we were talking about, you know, having issues and arguing with your spouse and back and forth. And they said, what is your goal when you argue uh, or have a conflict with your significant other? Is it to win mm -hmm. or is it? to become closer and work it out. And I'm like, well, what do you mean? They say, okay, well, you could win. There's a way to win an argument, but then what you're left with is an angry, resentful, um, distanced partner. Right. The other option is to find out how to become closer. And that may actually mean that you don't necessarily win the argument. Or agree even. Or agree. Right. And I thought, wow, that is... That's totally true because there are ways of arguing that will make you win an argument. Well, but then what have you won? You know, that's, right. that's not much of an epiphany for you because this is, this is actually when I get interviewed and people, one of the most common, the number one question I get asked uh, when interviewed is, how the hell do the four of us all work together? Mm. Yeah. How did you have four type A alpha personality entrepreneurs and then four get together and then not have conflict? And that's the reason why is because even when we have our most heated conversations is the desired outcome is to draw closer together and to win. Collectively, not win the argument individually. I don't care if I'm more right or you're or you're more right in the situation. I don't give a shit about that. I care that we learn together, we get closer to the right answer. And if that means your way was the the more right way or mine was, that doesn't matter. You know, it's irrelevant. You know what that means? Mm -hmm. What that means is sometimes you have to go against your feelings. Do you know how fucking hard that is? Oh, yeah. I don't think people realize that because sometimes your feelings tell you, uh, no. Fight, push back. No, you got to win. No, that person, you know, said that hurtful thing. You got to say something hurtful back. So what you literally have to do is you have to go against your feelings, which is hard. That's mm -hmm. so hard because you're literally sitting there going against your feelings and it doesn't feel right because your feelings make you want to, you know, do something. And when you go with your feelings, man, the surge that that provides, like the the, the overall consuming feeling of a yes. Yeah. Well, the first step in that is recognizing that you have a bias. Mm. that we all do and it's impossible to eliminate totally impossible so that that's the mistake that we make and it, it, I, we see i see this a lot going on right now like like you're going to like we're trying to eliminate bias like you can't you have it yeah. you you have it everybody has it recognizing it and then switching over to the other system and thinking logically about it is the key and accepting and being okay with i am biased because these are my experiences it's not your fault that's the way the brain operates mm -hmm. it works that yeah. way if it's been in situation 1 situation 2 situation 3 and all three of those situations have have shown you something your brain then downloads that information and that it, it's it's it, that's what it's reality mm -hmm. yeah. so the the key is to be able to know like okay no matter if we're going back and forth and I passionately disagree with you because of my experiences or how my brain is operating is recognizing that I automatically have a bias and can I logically think to see your side of this and then come together on something. And like you said, my goal is to come closer to an understanding and understand that I have a bias. So do you, but I want to, I oh, yeah. want to learn yours. I want to learn why your brain operates. Everybody that way. has a different journey and it all started in a completely different spot on the map. Mm -hmm. And so it's like, it's, it's really important to understand that everybody has a different perspective and how can we understand those perspectives a little bit more clearly. It, it Absolutely. And realize that when your feelings are heightened is when you are most easily manipulated and influenced. Most easily. It is very hard to trick or manipulate or fool somebody who's calm, collected, and listening. It's very hard. It's super easy. To do it to someone that's pissed off, afraid, especially people who are afraid. You can't, oh boy. You can't see yeah. the gorilla on the basketball court. Oh, that's a great video. Yeah, that's exactly yeah. what we're talking about right now. It's a, the, I mean, the research like on that's incredible. It's a, you, if you tell, 
and and that the example they're showing is that if you're if the brain is focused in this area, right, and they could be and more more often than not, it's working in that first system. It's emotionally reacting, so it's in this. Something could be in in your sight. You can be yeah, looking at yeah. it and still not see it. That's so fascinating. It, you know? uh, it's it, and again, yeah. and you're right because what your mind is doing constantly is it's creating a hallucination. It's it's mm. interpreting signals and giving you what you what it thinks it's you need to see. Filtering and making it easier. Yeah, and that's that's a, here's the other thing too is we can't is chew human behavior. We can't uh, throw it out and think that we can all of a sudden completely change everything and organize things in ways that are like, I'll give you an example. One of the main reasons why those Marxist philosophies have such a terrible track record, by the way, it's a hundred percent fail record throughout all of history. One of the reasons why it's so terrible is because it is completely opposite of human nature. What they try to do is they try to say everybody needs to have equal result. Yeah. And we'll use all the force we possibly can to make this happen. It results in destruction. And de Now, what is human nature? Well, human nature is choices. Every time you make a choice, you are deciding something is better than the other thing. You're driving your car, you take a right. Why don't you take a left? Going right is better. You put on a shirt. Why'd you put that shirt on, not the other one? Because that shirt was better. So what does that look like? What does that ultimately look like? Well, it ultimately looks like we value certain things more than other things, and we value people that give us or provide things more than other people. Now, what does that ultimately mean? Let's get, let's go down all the, way, all the way down the line. It means that some people are going to have more and are going to be more valued than other people. Human nature, we're not a uh, hive mind, we're not bees and ants, we're humans, so that's the way it works. So let's stop forcing so hard or trying to force human nature to be different because it results in something terrible. Rather, we should yeah. understand Celebrate it. Celebrate the differences. Understand it, work together. That's really the only way we've ever been able well, to you can't eliminate progress. that because it's instinctual and it, and it, it serves its purpose, right? Going back to the explaining again, the system one and system two, it's like it, it you need those quick, if you were always- it's all part of who we are. Well, yeah. And if you were always operating in, in two, you would never get anything done. If every decision you had to make, putting on a t-shirt, taking a left turn, slow, right? Yeah. yeah. It was a slow process and you had to think about it and break it all down all the time. You would never get anywhere in life. So you rely on both of these systems and you, mm -hmm. and so the idea is knowing that when you're at the greatest risk and then the, and you naturally are going to go to your instinctual side, how do I stop that? Because it's a high risk. Cause this could uh, be very damaging, like a, mm -hmm. You know, for example, we'll go back to, uh, you know, how we started this conversation with Glassman. You know, Glassman did an instinctual knee jerk reaction. He was operating in system one, said some shit. Right. That was high stakes because he just lost his company yeah, over it. Right. That was a bad decision by operating in system one when he should have stuck and paused. And thought in yeah. system two, How are they, and they can interpret this. exactly what's yep. my and that's why I love, one of my favorite lessons ever in life and in business was, you know, learning desired outcome. And you know, I and I try and, and, and teach this to anybody that I'm working with or developing. And that's like before you 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 say do or react to anything, especially when the stakes are high, is to always, no matter what it is. I'm talking about a conversation with your your spouse, talking about uh, having one with an employee, anything that has got a, a high risk behind it. Is what is my desired outcome? Mm -hmm. What do I want to happen from this? And a lot of times, if you play out what you're thinking you want to say or what you're thinking what you want to do. Many times it doesn't lead to your desired outcome. And you know that you just don't stop to think about that. Like, oh, uh, this is how I feel. So I'm going to say this. Okay. What is your desired outcome? Do you want X, Y, and Z to happen? Because, and is that the greatest path to get there? Many times when you can ask somebody to ask themselves that, they, they, they will go, oh, you know what? You're right. If I do say that, and if this is my true desired outcome, Dude, I want this to do you, happen. Do you know how many times I've changed my mind or changed my reaction based off of that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Every mm -hmm. single time, almost every time I have a reaction and I stop and ask myself that, it turns into, oh yeah, I guess you probably shouldn't say it that way. You know, there is a there are some remedies to to some of the these the, the downfalls of these systems. One of them is to understand uh, individualism. And to to dis to discard most forms of collectivism. Now, what does that mean? That means that generalizing there's some value to it, but you always want to when you look at people, you always want to look at them as an individual. Does that person represent a bunch of people or just themselves? Are their actions talking about them, or does it represent a bunch of uh, people? And at the end of the day, look, the the smallest of all minorities is the individual. So if you can go down to that point and protect that and look at that, you'll protect every other group or, or minority or whatever. 
Oh, what stressful conversations! I swear. <laughs> all, these, all these conversations are so yeah. are so. Fun. Are you guys finding yourselves uh, drinking more uh, and using more? Justin, for sure. I'm, <laughs> <laughs> I'm not the big roll me. Around well, I'm not. Bus. I mean, you know me. I, I I go to the grass. You know, what I'm saying that's in my yeah. direction. So if Did I you just say grass, yeah, yeah. yeah. I haven't grass, heard it called. Yeah, I haven't yeah. heard it called that's grass. Like such a seventy. Yeah, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, go to the grass. That's the way. That's the direction <laughs> I'm going. Yeah, so so <laughs> that's that settles me down more than uh, having a drink or two. But uh, Justin, yeah. I think would always go that. I mean, yeah, am I right I or no? No, no, you're not wrong. So, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I've I've definitely like upped my intake a bit, and it's just mainly to take the edge off a bit. Like, just ah, it's just it's this overwhelming feeling that I'm just trying to kind of like you know wipe that off, out out of my system. That energy, just trying to like just chill and and kind of get myself back to to you know like homeostasis. But it. It, 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 it's one of those things I'm monitoring because I could I could find myself, ooh, that does help to kind of take the edge off, but then I'm like a little excessive on the weekends. Yeah, now do you, you, you go ahead. No, I was going to ask if you and Courtney kind of have, because one of the things I do notice about you, Justin, you're really good. Um, like, well, I guess it's really good, but it's it's a pain in the ass when I'm trying to get a hold of you. Uh, <laughs> after we leave work around four or five, by that time, you're normally pretty disconnected. I can rely on Doug. Doug's yeah. pretty much, he's there till midnight or one with me, so he'll respond to the thread. Uh, Sal's hit or miss. You're pretty consistently not. Yeah. Uh, do you have like a routine that you you have set up like as far as like uh, I just completely detach and decompress? Like what does it look like? Yeah, I do. I, I I've been really trying to make that a priority, and I think everybody kind of needs to to step back and kind of figure out like where their priorities lie. And for me, I've I've just noticed that um, uh, I, I was on this pattern of checking my phone and then really just diving into all these like excess things that I need to accomplish and always, you know, not really like prioritizing throughout my day where I could accomplish it then versus when I get home. And then I would just like kind of put it off mm -hmm. and then, and then take it all in. And that would interrupt my time with, with my family and, and my conversations would be terrible with my wife. And then my kids would be showing me things I would just, uh, you know, like acknowledge, but wouldn't, I wasn't present enough to really un like see what was right in front of me, and that really frustrated me. What, so. a, what a good man! That's very, 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 very smart. You know, you 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 talked about drinking. Uh, I have to address this. So, one of our sponsors, Zbiotic, right? And yeah. they, for the listeners who don't know, know Zbiotic is this probiotic that's designed to you drink it before you drink alcohol. It's amazing, and it can in in the bacteria in this particular product actually eats or helps degrade or break down some of the negative byproducts of alcohol. So like you, you don't feel so crappy the next day and it's mm -hmm. actually crazy, crazy effective. And one of the reasons why it's effective, and this is the messages I've been getting, is because they took a normal bacteria, the same bacteria you'll find in like natto, which is a, a type of fermented soy, and they genetically modified it. So actually went in there and they modified the bacteria to when it when it's doing its job to produce this enzyme that breaks down the negative byproducts of alcohol. So you can't find any bacteria that does this. It's only when they genetically modified this particular bacteria. So people are like, oh my God, it's genetically yeah. modified this and that. Our one GMO product. Yeah. No, <laughs> you know, and I, this is what I want to bring up. Yeah. You know, my beef with GMOs isn't necessarily the GMO product itself. It's, and this is not true for Zbiotics. Zbiotics doesn't use glyphosates or other shit like that. But when you have GMO like plants, off, it's not the the GMO plant itself. It's not the GMO corn that might be showing problems. It's the fact that that corn was modified to accept tons of uh, herbicide, and it's the herbicide that the residue of that that may cause issues for people. So Zbiotics doesn't they don't spray anything with herbicide. There's no pesticide. It's just the bacteria, but it has been modified to 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 produce an enzyme. It's and it's very specific just to this product because again, it's 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 their patented product. That actually breaks down the byproducts of alcohol, and you, if you tend to like I do, feel crappy the day after drinking. Yeah. This stuff is like. Well, magic. I've done my own little experiments with it. I, I brought a few home for me and Courtney, and uh, you, you know, doing the, the tampon thing that yeah, people are doing that, all, that's yeah. popular right now. <laughs> what the hell, is that? dude? Okay, <laughs> yeah, you haven't heard so this? yeah, I heard about this. This was uh, some. It, it was even kids. It was like boys were doing this right at at some school where they would take tampons, they would put like rubbing alcohol and soak it in it, and then they'd stick it up their butt. And get fucking drunk. Wow. Yeah. Loaded. I feel like you'd have to get drunk first. That doesn't sound like a sober idea. <laughs> like, yeah. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I know. Like, who's the friend that started? The, hey, guys. Yeah. Like, I got yeah. this idea. Yeah, or friend that helps you out. Yeah, right? I was hey. like, wait a minute, guy. 
Hey, yeah. what, what did I say earlier about teenagers? Knowledge, no wisdom. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? One of those well, one, think, one operating that first system. Bro, a lot. Think, think about the things we used to smoke. You know, like like banana peels and like dumb shit. I'm like telling that. you, yeah. some kid with lots of knowledge, is like, hey, you know, you could get drunk through your rectal cavity, yeah. and he's like, we could just do this, and then no wisdom. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Oh, I blame yeah. Jackass for that, right? That's where that got popular. Before that, I had never even heard of anybody trying. I feel like that would burn the hell out of your butt. Oh right? yeah, I'm sure. I it mean, does. that's right up there with with huffing paint chips. You know, like that's that's stupid. Yeah. First question is from Black T Shirt Seven: Are stomach vacuums an effective ab exercise? Will they help make your belly flatter, as some claim? Oh, uh, the good old vacuum pose. Yeah. Sure they will. They Well, they're not an ab exercise, so let's be clear. You don't take a vacuum and, and put it on your stomach. No, you that's... Don't, you don't do that. Don't do that. Yeah. Um, no, it's, it's so it's not an ab exercise. So the abs, they attach at the, at the pelvis, they attach up at the rib cage, and when the abs contract, they bring the rib cage closer to the pelvis, like a crunch. The muscles that you're working... When you suck in your stomach, that's what a vacuum pose is, right? So it's like imagine you're at the beach and somebody attractive walks by and you want to make your stomach look flatter. So what do you do? You suck in your belly button a little bit. That's called the transverse abdominus, the TVA. And that muscle literally is like your body's weight belt. It literally cinches in and is like a brace. So if you've ever worn a weight belt and you wonder why it makes you feel more stable, it's because it's increasing core stability. Well, the TVA on its own will do that and it does it by by pulling in. So if you make that muscle stronger, yes, it can, especially if you have a weak one, it can shrink your waist. A really weak TVA aside from producing you know, low back problems and stability issues, remember you're standing. So gravity's pushing your organs down and then they're going to kind of come out. Um, and so strengthening the TVA kind of brings everything Tighter, and I've actually measured this with clients. Um, typically, I would have a client lose a quarter to a half inch around their waist um, when they would practice uh, effective vacuum poses without getting any leaner. It was all because they got strong in that area. Women post-pregnancy, this is a very important exercise yeah. for you because when you're pregnant, the TVA muscles they stretch and atrophy to make room for baby, mm -hmm. and when you're done with and you have your baby, if you don't target this muscle, it doesn't have a good reason to get tight again. This was one of those I had to explain a lot, especially with uh, you, you know women who had uh, just had a, had a kid and came back and were really trying to get that flatness of the stomach again, and uh, were doing crunches for days and just didn't understand why didn't have the same response. And so to to be able to get that gain, regain that connectivity to the TVA uh, makes a massive difference. And it is something that you can work on and, and you know reconnect and rebuild and, and get strong. Again. Well, this is also a great time to point out how stupid corsets are too, and waist trainers, right? Yeah. So we, we haven't talked about those in a long oh, yeah. time. I know that I think I saw a question not that long ago, and we're like, oh wow, we haven't addressed that in a while. But that when you wear those corsets or waist trainers, uh, this is what you what you atrophy. I mean, you are you are creating an artificial TVA in a sense, drawing in your stomach. The problem with that is you weaken those muscles by wearing some of like that. And same thing goes for the guys that love to wear their weight belt the entire time they work out, like all the time. Like it's not a good idea to do that. You want to be able to train those muscles that draw the stomach in, not just for aesthetic reasons, so you look cooler or look better or a flatter stomach, but because that's your support system. I mean, it's, I think it's 28 or 32 different muscles internally that it's made up of that wraps around the spine and works as a vacuum around the spine to support it. If you wear a, a corset or these waist trainers or even your belt tight all the time while you're working out, you start to weaken those muscles. Uh, and arguably, some of the most important muscles in the entire body. It's yeah. so absolutely ridiculous. Yeah, absolutely. And it's not even just weakening. You wear a belt. You you actually teach your 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 core muscles to do the opposite right, push out. of what they do normally because they push out against the belt. So the belt provides that stability. But when you don't wear a belt, the more effective way to build stability or the effective way to do it naturally is for things to kind of draw in and, and tighten up. It's funny because vacuum poses used to be a uh, very big part of bodybuilding in the early days. Bodybuilders would get on stage and they'd suck in their midsection and show their rib cage and how small their waist was. And yeah, you don't see that much anymore. Is that not like part of their posing? They're bringing routine? it. They bring it. They're bringing it back in the the new division, the classic oh, posing. Okay. Yeah. So it's it's. They're, did they, you practice these when you competed? Uh, I did, but not like on stage, right? Mm -hmm. So like part of men's physique that that's not like a, a, a staple pose, but. I, I understood the value of it, you know, to be able to make, because when you're, so when I'm up there, like 
I'm keeping my my core drawn in the entire time. Mm-hmm. Now, the, the, and that takes it, the more you practice that, the the more natural it becomes to do that. So if I do a good job at training that the transverse abdominis to be able to draw in like that and make my waist look smaller, that's only going to make me be able to present better on stage because then I can keep that drawn in and tight while I'm also you know flexing my shoulders and my back and doing all my other poses. So. I, I practiced it. Uh, it wasn't part of my actual train of uh, my routine uh, as far as my posing routine, but it was absolutely part of my training routine. Yeah, if you want to look at like a cool bodybuilding vacuum pose, just Google, just Google Frank Zane vacuum pose. He had this famous one with his arms behind his head, and, and it was actually quite impressive. Next question is from Shrumpf836. When trying to gain strength, is it beneficial to stay in the three to five rep range for all of your lifts or just the core lifts? Okay, so let's assume that you're uh, phasing your workouts. Okay, so let's assume that you go three to five reps, but then after you know a little while, you might go to higher reps so that you can not allow your body to plateau. Um, the low rep ranges are good for maximal strength. Not all exercises, though, lend themselves well to really low reps. So what I mean by that is like, Deadlift, bench press, squat, um, overhead press. Those work really well for like the three Combo to five rep range. Yeah. Isolation exercises, not so much. Like curls and laterals and, you know, leg extensions and stuff like that. They don't lend themselves well because the, uh, not saying that you can't do this, but most people lack the control, the stability, and the form to be able to produce a good technique with heavy weight. With like a lateral, if you do like three reps with a lateral, it ends up looking like uh, like a clean. Well, it, it, last time we we talked about this like a year or two ago, and it, it, a lot of people it confused a lot of people because then, then they thought that like we're saying that there's no value at all in doing like six reps of a bicep curl or doing some of these isolation exercises. There there is value in it, but the point that you're trying to make is, is exactly that: is most people when you're doing something like a lateral raise or doing a small isolation movement, you can't help but allow the dominant muscles to take over when you lift a really, really heavy load. So yeah. you you just got to find, I think the key is, is finding a, a heavy enough load that you can still keep, maintain and be in control. The problem is what people end up doing is they go to a heavy enough load that they can still perform the movement. But what ends up happening in the movement, they end, the bigger muscles take over. I love yeah. to talk about the rear delts with this. This is like one of the things that I struggled with for a long, long time. And so do I saw a lot of like competitors that I'd be helping with when they go to train rear delts, it's really hard to not let your upper back take over the movement. The upper back is a much bigger, stronger, dominant part of your body than the little rear delt is. And so here you are trying to do a rear delt exercise and you know the macho kid in me would want to keep increasing weight, keep increasing weight, but then now it's turned into a back exercise and it's not really a rear delt exercise. Mm-hmm. That doesn't mean that going heavy, lifting heavy for my rear delts is bad or doesn't isn't isn't a good idea. It's that when most most people go heavy on those small isolation movements. They they can't help themselves but to allow their bigger, more dominant muscles to take over. So if you are going to load those isolation exercises, you you got to be careful with can I do perform the exercise or can I keep the the, the movement focused on that small muscle the entire time? Because you can load it just fine and and find. A, a really challenging five to six reps with those isolation exercises, but you can't you can't let yourself get caught up in oh I can add ten more fifteen more pounds just because the body can actually use some body English to yeah. get it through. I, Does that make sense? I rarely it makes perfect sense, and I I rarely go lower than five or six reps for isolation exercises. Rarely, like I'll do singles all the time for bench press, squat, deadlift, overhead press, no problem. I almost never do a, a curl for one. Yeah. You know, or a lateral for one. It just doesn't lend itself well. Not saying you can't, but you got to really, I mean, you got to be perfect form. Yeah, without compensating at all. I mean, it's, yeah, that that's it, it's just difficult. I, I get what you're saying. I, I think there's a way to do it in terms of like picking the right load. Um, but in, in terms of like, you know, isolation exercises, the best value to those typically is, you know, a higher rep range. Well, we just got to remember that. And this, it's funny because in the intro, we talked about the brain. The brain operates the same way as the body does. We're, it's lazy by nature. So it is always going to take the easiest path. So if you do a movement and you are trying to, to do it to work a small muscle, 
the the body doesn't work that way. It's going to use yeah. everything it can it to wants help efficiency. Yeah, exactly. It wants to be efficient. It's lazy by nature, and so you've got to be at a pretty advanced lifter to be able to take a movement that is for a very small muscle and it's an isolation exercise and load it really heavy. And that's the reason why on the show we we typically tell people not to do that. And and that's what happened last we had this conversation a year ago and then we got all these people that want to come on and debate over it. and it's like listen nobody here is saying that you can't load an isolation exercise heavy and get benefit from it. It's that the average person doesn't know how to 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 delineate from their body being lazy and taking the easy path versus the the right one that's going to give them the best bang for their buck. Next question is from Ander Beth. In each of your opinions, which popular exercise movements do you think are actually useless and a waste of time? <laughs> <laughs> you know, this is a. I'll tell you why this is a tough question because. In the right context, Nothing with the is. right application, yeah. all exercises have value. So I'm going to kind of change it a little bit because um, I, if it's done the right way for the right person, the right context, any exercise can have value. So let's talk about popular exercises that most people get no value out of because it's the wrong context and the wrong application, right? Mm -hmm. I think uh, a lot of these, uh, these machines, a lot of times, for most people, tend to be a waste of time. Um, the inner and outer, you know, thigh machine or whatever you want to call them, the, the bad girl, good girl machine. That's the first one that comes to mind yeah, for me. Yeah, oftentimes mm -hmm. people, they're, they're using them wrong. They don't need to use them. The contact, mm -hmm. just, it's just a, you're kind of wasting 15 minutes sitting on that machine. There's things that are way, way more uh, effective, uh, you know, for your Which, body. Which, yeah, I've heard some people try and argue it in terms of rehab, like, uh, uh, you know, sure, to get the knee to track there's better. Be an but there's an exception to every rule, yeah, right? Yeah. There's, exactly. There's, there's not a, I just there's, had to bring that up. Right. No, it's a great point. And there's not a single exercise that we can name that somebody- it's always a waste. Can, right. That somebody can come back and argue and say, what? What about this situation? Well, yeah, that situation. But so, I, so I'm going to try and pick something that I, I see a lot and I would say- is a waste of time for prob probably ninety percent of the people that I see doing it. And it's like a, a butt kickbacks. Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah, so one. so glute kickbacks or what butt kickbacks, whatever you want. Uh, very very popular exercise. People do them all the time in the gym. They do them because you can feel it in your butt. Um, but I see them doing it. You know. 15, 30 plus reps of this all day long. That exercise is probably one of the biggest wastes of time that I see most people doing. You get far more benefits doing a loaded exercise for the glutes, like a hip thrust or like a squat or like a sumo deadlift. Those, if you want to grow your butt and you're doing cable kickbacks and that's like a staple in your routine, unless you are literally using it as a primer mm. before you go into one of those big lifts that I just named, it's damn near a waste of time. I don't know how popular, but I've seen this in every gym and it insults me every single time I see it. Uh, and that's, you know, over at the, uh, the, the assisted pull-ups oh, yes. and then pushing their foot oh, down against one. the, yeah, against the weight that's supposed to then elevate you up and, and relieve you of, of your body weight on some level, but they're using it to just push and extend their leg down. Uh, I want to slap you in the face. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's like a single leg press that they're using it for. <laughs> yeah, it's not even that. Down. Single leg press is way No, no, better. no. They're, they're, it's like they're doing an extremely uh, ineffective, ineffective version. Ineffective. Yeah. Uh, yeah I, I just, I can't even wrap my brain around. It hurts my brain, and I just want everybody <laughs> to stop doing that. Yeah, I, I agree with you on that. I think that one's a, a terrible one. I, I do, I, you know, what's what's that one chest press? It's like a chest press where they, they'll squeeze a plate, and then they'll... Oh, press it. Sven, Sven, Sven press. Sven. Sven. Okay. Yeah. Sven press might has some applications sometimes. 99% of the people I see doing it, I don't understand why. It's a total waste of your time. You're you're squeezing your chest. You don't need to press anything to do that. You can just push your hands together. It reminds me of uh, Cry to Kid Part 2, right? Uh, Where yeah. he's like doing his little like meditative... <sighs> and then he breaks the glass. Uh, yeah, or ice. ice. Yeah, ice. Yeah. My bad. <laughs> Next question is from Arison Driscoll. You've talked about how some trendy ideas are actually BS, such as women-specific workouts and diets. Yet the Mind Pump blog posts lately tend to be titled along the lines of best ways for women to lose weight, how to eat if you are an ectomorph, etc. 
Is this just for marketing, or has your opinion changed? Oh, the beautiful dance that yeah. we have. Yee, to- I, I, so this I, is fun. I picked this specifically so I could kind of break down uh, the strategy. So the the overarching reason why we do Mind Pump, the main purpose behind it is to counter all the bad information that's out there and provide good, accurate, actually helpful information. I mean, as trainers, we saw how much how damaging um, the fitness space can be because it is. It's full of just a lot of terrible stuff. We all succumbed to it as, as people working out ourselves when we were kids. We saw how much damage it did to our clients. So we wanted to beat it. Now, here's the problem. The problem isn't because there isn't good information that's out there. There's always been good fitness information. The problem is nobody reads it or looks at it because they don't get any attention. They suck at it. They suck at the marketing piece. They suck at the getting out there and getting people to pay attention. So in order to beat people, we have to beat them with fire. We have to fight fire with fire. So if we do a post that says best ways for women to lose weight, you better believe in the blog, we're going to break down how there is really, really is no difference between right. men and women. And we're going to educate you. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to use uh, marketing. Ta- proven tactics that work. that To get people's attention so that then we can deliver the right information. This is a, a very, very effective strategy. And I don't think we could beat the excellent marketers out there. Uh, unless we get people's attention, we have to. Well, this is this is unintentionally uh, turning into a, a similar conversation for me, at least. That this is an example again of system one and system two, and the way the brain works is everybody who sees these ads. If we were to come at them logically, you know, asking them to operate in system two in a Facebook ad, nobody would click on it. Yeah. Very small percentage of mm-hmm. people would see that come in their feed and then their brains switch over to that logical way of thinking. It doesn't and it, resonate. It doesn't. And so the idea is for them is to is to catch them in that in that first systematic part of the brain where they are just reactive. Oh my God, I want to lose weight. Oh my God, I need to do this. And so they She looks like me. And then they then in the blog or in the episode, we get them to switch over into the second system where they can think logically about it. But we can't do that in a quick snippet that's five seconds in their feed. You gotta mm-hmm. we gotta play to the knowing that that's the way the brain operates and that that's what's gonna get their attention. Then when they when they grab it, they download it, then we can get them to switch over into the other one and think logically so about this, the information. So I'll give you guys I'll give it a great example of how I uh, I've used this in the past. So in the past I would communicate to clients who all they care about is how they look. All they're focused on is losing weight. All they care about is what looks what's in front of the mirror. Now, as a trainer, I understood that this was a problem because when you're driven by that, um, you end up having unhealthy behaviors. You end up eating in a particular way that's damaging. You end up training yourself in a way that's punishing yourself. And you get this on the wagon, off the wagon type of behavior. So what I wanted to communicate to people is, look, rather than focusing on how you look, let's focus on how you feel. Let's focus on your health. Let's focus on taking care of yourself instead of hating yourself. Now that's all logical. That's you all you can't do that day one. Though. No, and it, it's all logical, but but it does. It's not going to come across. I'm not going to be effective to someone who just wants to look a particular way. So what I did is I I changed how I communicated a little bit, and this is what I said. Well, you can definitely focus on how you look, but here's what will happen: if you focus on how you look, your eating habits and your exercise routines will eventually make you look bad because you're not really listening to your body. If you focus on your health and how you feel. The side effect of that is you'll look better. Now, what did I do? I took what the person, and and by the way, that's all true. I'm not lying. I took what that person was most motivated by, and I used it to get them to understand how to do the right stuff. Now, here's what ends up happening. I get the person who all they care about is how they look. They're listening to me because I convinced them that if they listen to their body, take care of themselves, they'll look better anyway. Through the process, they start to realize this is the better way to be. I actually should care about myself. I actually should listen to my body. So when we're looking at the fitness space, it's like, okay, how do I take eyes off of that terrible individual over there who's promoting horrible, uh, you know, unhealthy behaviors? How do I get people to look, go from there to what we're saying? Um, You know, it's like, how do I beat the person that says lose 30 pounds in 30 days? Do I say, hey, lose 30 pounds in 12 months? Like, that's not going to (laughs) work. It just isn't going to work. So I got to fight fire with fire, bring them over and then use effective communication to communicate what's really good for you, what really is going to work. And I tell you what, it's the reason why Mind Pump 
um, has achieved the level of, its, of success that it's achieved is because we're getting good at that strategy. Uh, look, Mind Pump is recorded on video as well as audio. So if you like listening to our podcast, try watching the podcast. Go to YouTube, Mind Pump Podcast. It's our channel. Every episode is video recorded. Um, and it's easier to share that way as well. Also, if you want to communicate with us and you have any questions or opinions, or you just want to tell Justin he's handsome, uh, you can find us on Hi, Mom. Instagram. You can find Justin at Mind Pump Justin. You can find me at Mind Pump Sal. Adam at Mind Pump Adam. Oh, and by the way, Doug has a page, Mind Pump Doug, and he posts all the behind the scenes podcasting stuff. So all you tech uh, people out there that want to learn the ins and outs of podcasting, yeah. go check out Doug. There's your guru at Mind Pump Doug. 